enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name or cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. These are the words of Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus to seek and to save the lost. Thank you that uh, you so loved the world that you gave and Father, I pray right now, I pray, would you uh, open my mouth to speak properly, to teach in a way that is true and that is right and that is helpful and that exalts the Lord Jesus. And Holy Spirit, would you open hearts and open minds as we hear the, the text of Scripture, as we hear the, the preaching of your word. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and allow us to respond in repentance and in faith. And I pray that this would be a time where Jesus would be exalted and where our hearts would be drawn to him. I pray it in his precious name. Amen. You guys may be seated. So we're wrapping up, and you're like, wow, that's a long text of Scripture. I mean, like, we've heard you speak on one verse for uh, longer than we have time for today. So how is this going to go? Well, here's the bottom line. As we're wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount, and that would be uh, 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, we are now coming to the conclusion of Jesus' teaching. And the conclusion is four different segments that all are, in essence, teaching the same thing, all right? And so uh, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, if you go back to chapter 4, verse 23, what we heard is that he is now preaching the good news or the gospel of the kingdom. So this is all about the, the kingdom attitudes, kingdom principles, the law of the kingdom, the rule of the kingdom, the behavior in the kingdom, those who might enter and those who will be left out. That's what Jesus has been talking about. That when Matthew introduces this and he talks about how Jesus is now preaching, he's going village to village and he's healing many and the message he is preaching is this. This is how Matthew sums it up. And Jesus went about preaching and he said, repent, that is turn back to God, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has given 
His hearers has given his disciples and has given the crowds that are kind of listening in, right? Because he's preaching, he's sitting down, the disciples come to him, and we know that the crowds also are kind of leaning in. And so he has been given them two options. There's different, uh, there's different ways. There's two different paths in essence. And so what he starts with is he gives them the attitudes of the kingdom versus the attitudes of the world, right? And, and what we call this is the Beatitudes, those things that uh, you are blessed if you have that mindset, if you have that heartbeat. And, and many times Jesus says, blessed are those who. And, and some of them, uh, man, we're like, that seems counterintuitive. He says, blessed are those who are poor, in spirit, and you go, man, I don't want to be poor. I don't even know what poor in spirit means, but I don't want to be poor. I want to be rich. I want to be affluent. I want to be wealthy. And Jesus says, those of you who are recognizing that in you, there's no good thing, and you are poor in spirit, desperately needy, you will be blessed. Wow, that's, that's not an attitude that our world has. The second then is that he goes on and he says, blessed are you if you mourn. And you're like, no, blessed are you if you celebrate. Wrong. And Jesus says, no, if you mourn, if you mourn over your sinfulness, if you mourn over the condition of this world, there's a blessing that comes. Blessed are you if you're meek. What is meek? Well, it is humble. And we say, no, no, you've got you to self-assert, right? And so we've gone in detail through all those Beatitudes. And if you missed that, it's online. You can go back and listen. I don't have time to explore all of it. But Jesus essentially is contrasting the attitude of the kingdom, which is an attitude of humility, is an attitude of mercy, it's an attitude of mourning over the unrighteousness and the brokenness both of our own lives and our own souls and the brokenness of the world around us versus the attitudes of this world. So that's the first kind of contrast he does. Then he goes on and he talks about, well, you heard it said, and this is the letter of the law. And a lot of times we discovered, oh, this is actually what it said, but this is not the whole verse, or this is not what God meant by this verse. And so Jesus then contrasts the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. And one of those examples was divorce, right? It's like, and they're like, well, Moses said, give her a certificate of divorce and you're scot-free. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. That is not what the intent of God was. And from the beginning, it was not so. Because when God made man and female, right, man and woman, he said that uh, for this reason, a man will leave father and mother and will cling to his wife and the two will be one flesh. And so Jesus is saying, this is the spirit of the law. This is what God has intended. This is what God has purposed. This is how God has set it up. Your wickedness and your evil attitude is what's ruined everything. Then he goes on and he talks about the, the self-righteousness of mankind that wants to be seen by people, wants to be applauded by people. And he says, don't practice your righteousness before people, but practice your righteousness where only God can see. And God who is in secret will give you a rich reward. And then he talks about the difference between worshiping and loving money and worshiping and loving God. And so now as we, we get to this place, Jesus again puts before his hearers options. You can choose God's way or you can choose your way. You can choose the way that is presumably right and is going to lead you to success from a worldly standard. Or you can pick the way that's hard, the way that's difficult, the way that's challenging, the way that leads to persecution, the way that ultimately, however, leads to life. All right, so this is what Jesus is doing. And so what we will have is we will have the two paths, the two gates. That's kind of the first uh, section. Then he's talking about two trees and conversely, two types of fruit, good fruit and bad fruit. Then he's going to talk about two attitudes. 
The attitude that says, yeah, yeah, I, I profess, I profess, I profess. And the attitude that says, not only do I profess, and according to Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that's really important, but I also obey. And then he says this, two foundations. The foundation on the rock and the foundation on the sand. And so that's what we're going to explore. In it, in these verses, I probably, at least in my opinion, some of the hardest words that Jesus ever said. Because what he says in there is this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And then there is this this brutal assessment of Jesus himself where he says, I never knew you. Wow. It's an intense text that we get to kind of unpack today. And so uh, I just want to prepare your hearts. As as we're moving through this, we're going to explore the two different gates, the two different paths, the two different trees, the different kinds of fruit And we're going to take a look at what does it mean that Jesus would say to some, depart from me. I never knew you. All right. Now I'm hoping to end this with some encouragement at the end. So we'll see if we get there. No, I promise we'll get there. Uh, But this this is the text before us. All right. I didn't pick it. I did pick the book of Matthew. And uh, here we are. All right. So let's kind of get into this text. All right. Jesus here starts, and he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So Jesus immediately says there's two paths that you can take. And interesting enough, it's not just Jesus who did this, right? When we look throughout the Scripture, throughout the Old Testament, we see multiple people who do the exact same thing. I want to give you three examples of this. The first one is Moses, all right? And so Moses, who was the deliverer of Israel from Egypt, and when he then gives the law, Israel is in the desert, is in the wilderness. Uh, They rebel constantly. God keeps blessing them. They keep rebelling. Well, finally, as they're at at the very border of the promised land, Moses again speaks to the people of Israel. And this is what he says. As he is giving them the the rewards for obedience and the curses for disobedience, he says this. See, I have said before you today, life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But, but if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them. I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I shall call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life. Choose life. That's the word of Moses. It's intense, right? It's an intense contradiction right there. It's like, whoa, okay, life, that sounds good. Death, that sounds horrible. However, death is only eventual. And in the meantime, I get to kind of do what I want to do, what I consider right, what I consider is the path forward, the path of least resistance, right? The path that Jesus calls wide and easy. All right? So that's Moses. Then Joshua kind of does the same thing, right? So Joshua goes, conquers the land, splits it up between the tribes. At the end of his life, he is speaking to the people of Israel and very, very similar situation, right? He speaks to them and he says this, now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and 
in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served before, beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So Moses says his life and death, blessing and curse. And one is obedience and the other is disobedience. And Joshua here says, there is a way that you and your ancestors were used to. And I am calling you to a new way. So that's Joshua. And then David, uh, interesting enough, a while later, he is the second king of Israel. And he writes in the Psalms, first Psalm, writes that exact same concept. There is two different pathways. The pathway for the man of God and the pathway for the wicked. He says this in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seed of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. All right, and so what we have is then these two pathways. And when you read it like this, it sounds like, well, it's obvious. I'm just going to choose the way of the righteous. I'm going to choose the way of God. I'm going to choose the way of obedience. But right there is actually where the rub already comes because it is the way of obedience. And as people, we're not particularly good at obedience. I don't know if you knew this. Right? It's like one of those tricky ones. We're like, nah, I don't want to obey. I want to do it my way. Yeah, you, you're, you maybe like have this plan. You have this idea. You have this concept. You have this stuff that you want. But I want to do it my way. And my way sounds a lot more fun. And my way sounds a lot more enjoyable. And it sounds a lot more reasonable. It sounds a lot more logical. It sounds like a lot less opposition. Right? And so we then have Jesus saying, the gate is narrow. At that gate, what you have to leave behind is everything. See, that gate will not admit you with any luggage. It is so small, you have to leave everything behind. You have to leave your sin behind, your pride behind, your selfish ambition behind. You have to leave all your way, your will, your purposes behind. Jesus even says, if anyone comes to me, does not hate father and mother. So you have to leave your family, your friends, you have to leave it behind and you enter by the narrow gate. Wow, that sounds tough. That does not sound enjoyable. And then the road is hard. Okay, but like at least to have some encouragement. No, few travel on that road. It's just you. No one is saying, good job. No one is patting you on the back. No one is kind of like cheering you on along the way. No, that's the other way. That's the gate that is broad. Come, bring all your luggage. Bring your selfishness. Bring your selfish ambition. Bring your pride. Bring your arrogance. Bring your self-righteousness. It doesn't matter who you prioritize over God. Just go for it. It's going to be great. And on the way, there's all these people. It's like, oh, it's amazing. So many people. They're clapping. They're patting you on the back. They're saying, go for it. Go chase it. Go run after it. It's an easy way. It's a paved way. It's a beautiful way. Everyone's doing it. All the cool kids are on this way. And the way is easy. And the gate is wide. And there are many that are on it. Many are traveling, right? See, the, the way of this world, the way of your 
job, the way of your, your studies, the way of your high school, the way of your university, the way of our city is the way that is broad. It is the way that is easy. It is the way that is applauded. Right? And it starts kind of in a way where you're like, yeah, this is actually, that sounds good. Diversity of opinion. Oh, well, we love diversity of opinion. This is fantastic. We should have diversity of opinion, right? Because we're educated. This is really, really important. Let's have some diversity of opinion. Well, diversity of opinion, you can't have diversity of opinion unless you also have tolerance. What you need is you need some tolerance unless you're not to be tolerated, which is generally if you are a Bible-believing, Christ-following man or woman who believes that this is not relative, but this is the absolute truth and the Word of God that is ultimately what judges all all ideas, all concepts, all opinions. See, it is not something that is one of the opinions. It is the thing that stands in judgment over all the opinions. And so you have tolerance, right? You have compromise. And, and the minute you start compromising, then you have this thing called relativism. It's like, well, there's your truth and then there's my truth, right? I mean, it's just like, can, can we ever really tell? Yeah, we can. It turns out we can, right? Uh, this, this is a, a philosopher who said this. It's Rob, uh, Richard Rorty. He said, truth is, what our peers will let us get away with. That's pretty good truth, man. This is awesome. Like, because our peers, they're like, yeah, I want to live the exact same way. I'm going to pat you on the back. I'm going to applaud you. I'm going to like, yeah, just, oh, man, this is incredible. Go for it. You want to define your own, uh, your own truth? Go for it. You want to define your own right and wrong? Go for it. You want to define your own sexuality? Go for it. You want to worship yourself? I think that's a great idea. Go for it. And the Bible says, no, there's a standard. There is right and there is wrong. There is truth and there is error. There is a path that leads to destruction and there is a path that leads to life. And so our world is like, no, no, no. It's all relative. It doesn't matter. Right? We say this all the time. One of our values is biblical truth, not cultural relativism. Compromise, relativism. See, because very soon what you have you have this thing called syncretism. You know what syncretism is? It's when I take a little from this and a little from this and a little from this. It's like, yeah, yeah, I kind of like Jesus. I like all the things he says about, uh, like, you know, social aspects. But when he starts talking about being faithful to my spouse, when he starts talking about humility, when he starts talking about loving my enemies, I'm not so stoked about that. So maybe we can just kind of push that to the side. But man, yeah, yeah, you should, you should just love, love the poor and the needy. You should. Jesus said so. See, and we start taken from here and from there and from everywhere. And we're not bowing the knee to Jesus. We're just making Jesus one of the opinions. We're making Jesus one, ultimately, of the gods we choose to worship and adore. And our God has always said, my glory I will not give to another. I am not one of the gods. I rule supreme. And so... Our world says syncretism is the way to go. And then what we see is we see a moral and a spiritual permissiveness that leads us down a dark and a broken path. And the Bible says the end of that path, no matter how comfortable, no matter how wide, no matter how well traveled, no matter how much adulation and how much applause, the end of that way is destruction. Uh, C.S. Lewis said something that's, that I think is, is uh, worth quoting. A lot of what he says is worth quoting, but let me read this to you. He's talking about when he was 13 years of age, he kind of decided that he did not believe in God. And he did not believe in absolutes. 
Uh, he, he was very shaken by the death of his mother. And, and so he started pursuing what he calls higher thought. Let me read to you the quote. This is C.S. Lewis, the young Lewis, uh, writing about this moment at about 13 years of age. I was soon altering, I believe, to one does feel. That is nice and British, right? One does feel. It does sound great, though, because like, it's really noncommittal. Right? It's, it's, these are my feelings. How could my feelings be wrong? Well, I mean, like, if my feelings are not quite what your feelings are, can't we get along? Right? But if I say, I believe, or I believe this is the truth, now we have conflict. So here's Lewis. I was soon altering, I believe, to one does feel. And oh, the relief from t uh, tyrannous noon of revelation. I passed into the cool evening twilight of higher thought. Where there was nothing to be obeyed and nothing to be believed except what was either comforting or exciting. That's where much of our world is right now. There's no absolutes that we need to obey. There's no absolute truth that we need to bow the knee to. There's just relativism, just syncretism, just moral and spiritual permissiveness. And it all starts with abandoning truth and choosing this, I don't know, relativism, diversity of opinions. No, there's truth and there's error. And so Jesus says here, leave everything behind. Choose the narrow door. Uh, in John 10, I believe it's verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. I am the one through whom the sheep must pass to get to the Father. I am the door. That's why it's so restrictive. It is not Buddha and Muhammad and the Book of Mormon and the whatever. No, it is Jesus alone that leads to salvation. Jesus is the door and there's no other way to the Father. He says that. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So bow the knee and come to Jesus. The road is hard. The gate is narrow. And man, if, if you're like, no, nah, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if I believe that. I, I would say Jesus is pleading with you right now. And he's saying, come to me. I am the way to the Father. I am the way to life. And we go on. Now we get to the second part, right? The two trees right here. Beware of false prophets, Jesus says, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. All right, so what's, what, he's, what he's describing is there's a flock of sheep, and the wolf is all covered up, looking like a sheep. He's like, I'm going to have lunch. That is what sounds awesome right now. And Jesus says, beware. There's people that are sneaking in among the sheep who are not sheep, and who are not shepherds, but they're wolves. See, when he talks about the sheep, what is he talking about? He's talking about the church. He's talking about the believers. He's talking about people that are wanting to worship God, wanting to be in community. That's what he's talking about. So he's not talking about here, oh, watch out for other world religions. Nope, not what he's saying. He's saying in the church, among Christians, among the sheep, there is going to be some that look like sheep, but they are ravenous wolves. They're not your friend. They're not out for your benefit. They're not out for your good. They're not leading you to life. They are leading you to death and destruction. Right? And, and not just that, he says, beware of these false prophets. They're going to be in the church. Paul, in Acts 20, warns the elders in the church in Ephesus. And he says, beware. From your own number, there will arise fears, ravenous wolves. And they will lead the church astray. And they will destroy the faith of many. Right? Uh, if we look throughout the scriptures, we see Matthew 24 actually talks about that in the last days, there will be many false teachers 
uh, Paul says the same thing to Timothy, right? Uh, in Timothy, he says that there will be many false teachers, right? In chapter 3, he says, understand that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. And these times of difficulty will be just like fully permeated with false teachers, and what will happen is there will be people that will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness in sheep's clothing, but denying its power. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. Jesus is saying here what Paul will repeat, what the other apostles will talk about, which is there will be false prophets and false teachers, and they will increase as the time gets short. Now, at the, at the end here, so Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. And then he gives a couple examples, right? Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes? Nope. Are figs gathered from thistles? Nope. Aha. There you go. You understand. It's not hard. It's not complicated. A healthy, or, so every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. It's judgment what Jesus is talking about. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruit. Now, I've done a, a full-length sermon on false teachers and false prophets, so you can go back and listen to that. But let me really quickly give you three types of fruit that we need to inspect. All right? It's like, okay, I don't know. I don't agree with everything that's happening. It's like, is this a wolf or is this a shepherd? <laughs> is this a sheep? Is this a wolf? What is going on? Is this someone that is a good tree or is this someone that's a bad tree? Is this someone that I need to pay attention to? He, here are a couple of the things. Jesus says, recognize them by their fruit. So he's calling for discernment. Let me give you three of them. Number one, conduct and character. All right? Is that person displaying Christian character? A Christ-likeness? An increasing display of the fruit of the Spirit? Love and peace patience and kindness and goodness, right? Is that happening? Self-control? Or is this person constantly angry, constantly self-aggrandizing, constantly just violating every single one of those fruits of the Spirit? And if you want to read the whole list, Galatians 5.22. Is this person growing in their Christ-likeness? Are they out for the glory of Christ or are they out for their own glory? All right, so that's the fruit. Man, that's, that's really, really hard. All right, then how about their teaching? Is their teaching in line with the apostles' teaching? Is it, we would call it, orthodox? All right, why, why is Emerson spending all this time walking you through systematic theology? It's because we believe it's important that we are aware of what the truth is so that when a counterfeit comes over the horizon, we would immediately be able to identify it as such. That's the whole reason we're doing Bible doctrine. That's the whole reason that I'm here preaching. Part of it is, yeah, I want you to know about Jesus. I want you to know how to be saved. But also, I want you to know the truth. So is it in line with the, the teaching of the apostles. That's why we will not partner with any church that does not display the five fundamentals. If you're brand new, if you've never looked at it, we have a whole teaching series on it. Our five fundamentals are the deity of Christ. Anyone who denies the deity of Christ, false prophet, all right? Anyone who denies, second, the Trinity. Oh, no, 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 it's just like, no, whatever, oneness, Pentecostals. False prophet, all right? The deity of Christ, the Trinity. Salvation by grace alone. 
Oh, no, it's by grace and this other thing. It's by grace and this works. It's by grace and baptism. It's by grace and church attendance. It's by grace and tithing. It's by grace and whatever. The answer is no. False prophet. It's false teaching. All right? So no, absolutely not. We're not going to give in to that. Uh, the, the idea of the, the authority and the, and the inerrancy of Scripture. When people say, oh, well, yeah, that, I don't really like that part of the Scripture. Can we cut that out? Can we just not worry about that? False prophets. Oh, that part of the Bible that says, you know, it is one man and one woman in the con- covenant of marriage forever. It's like, no, can I just live with my boyfriend, live with my girlfriend? No. Can I just sleep around? No. Can I just have sex with whoever I want, whatever gender, doesn't matter? No. Biblically, that is not okay. All right? And so whenever you have people that are saying, it's fine. False prophets. All right? You're like, this guy, what did he have for breakfast? I want some of it. Okay, see what I'm saying? Jesus here is really, really serious about there is a way that leads to life and there is a way that leads to death. And you're like, yeah, God, I knew God was a judging God. No, God wants you to have life and have it abundantly. God knows that this world and these false prophets And these false teachers are trying to drag you away, trying to bring you to a place of ultimately destruction and death. And he has better for you. He has better for you. All right. Uh, The the final one is the return of Christ to rule and to judge. All right. This has to do with heaven and hell. Yes, there's a final judgment and Jesus is coming to execute on that. All right. So that's fundamentals. Teaching. Is the teaching in line? The next one is influence, right? What is the fruit of their teaching? What's the fruit of their teaching? Right? We, We read some of them in 2 Timothy. They're coming in and they're causing division. They're coming in and they're causing people to panic. They're coming in and they're causing people pain and sorrow. They're coming in and they're upsetting the faith of households. Oh, man, this is crazy, right? That is what what we're talking about. The, The fruit of their lives, the fruit of their ministry, the fruit of their teaching, the influence of their ministry is bad fruit. So pay attention. All right, we're gonna, I have, I'm going to have to hurry. All right, I'm going to have to hurry because otherwise this is all going to be sad and I want some encouragement for you guys. All right, so the next thing is, man, and he, here we go, all right? So these are the two attitudes. Let me just say what the two attitudes are and then I'm going to read it to you and hopefully you can see it in there. The two attitudes are, oh, yeah, 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 I love Jesus. Yeah, I love Jesus. Profession only. The other attitude is profession and obedience. Yes, I love Jesus. And Jesus is not just my savior. He's not just my homeboy. No, Jesus is Lord. He is king. He is God. He sits on the throne and he deserves to be honored, worshiped, and adored. And that's what I intend to do. All right. So two different attitudes. One, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus is so great. The other is no, Jesus is great and I must do what he says. Let me read it to you. All right. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, Profession will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What does Jesus say in John? I believe it's it's chapter 6, verse 46 or something in that neighborhood. All right. He says, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Ooh. Same thing. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's these false prophets. That's these false teachers. That's these people who are on the broad road with many applauding, many celebrating. That is, and yes, that is seminary professors. Yes, that is Christian, so-called Christian pastors and leaders. We're not talking about, oh, the the Hindus and the Muslims and whatever. No, we're talking about Christians who are believing that they're saved, but they are not saved because they do not know Jesus. They do not obey Jesus. They do not worship Jesus, and they do not follow Jesus. 
And so because they're not following Jesus, but because they're following their own broad and easy road, it leads them to destruction. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Oh, they were preachers. They were preaching in the name of Jesus. It's like, yeah, preaching falsehood and lies. Did we not, in your name, cast out demons? Wow, that's, that's pretty incredible. There was some kind of deliverance ministry going on. Yeah, but they were the sons of Sceva, right, in the book of Acts, who were, yeah, one moment this is going pretty well. The next moment, the demon overpowered them, and they ran away bloody and weeping. And I think naked, but that's a different passage. Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty works? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. See, see Jesus says, right, even when we look through the scriptures, it is always... Let all those who are lawless stop practicing their lawlessness and turn to Jesus. Repent and turn to God. Recognize your need, your desperate need for his grace, your desperate need for the work of Jesus on your behalf. Recognize your desperate need for the death of Jesus on the cross so that you might be forgiven and saved. That's what Jesus is calling us to. But here he says, not everyone who claims the name of Jesus, not everyone who profess that they follow Jesus, not everyone who works at a seminary or a Christian college or a church is going to be with Jesus in eternity. And then the final illustration that he gives, and, and i got to be really qu quick here and go to the next point, is he says there's two foundations. There's the foundation on Jesus, on his word, and a, a foundation of obedience. And that house is built on the rock. And when the storms of life come, when the floods rise, when the, the wind blows and the rain falls, that house will stand. And there's a house that's built foolishly on some other foundation. And as the song says, all other ground is sinking sand. You build on Jesus or whatever you're building on is going to fail you. All right? And again, here he says the same thing. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man building his house on the rock. Everyone who hears these words and does not do them, verse 26, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Now, Jesus clearly is saying there's a way that leads to life and there's a way that leads to death. And, and, and I, I want you to know that you can have assurance of your salvation because when you read this, I remember when I read this for the first time, I was like, am I saved? Can I know that I'm saved? Can I have confidence that, that I'm not one of those that says, Lord, Lord? These are terrifying words of the Lord Jesus spoken to a large crowd of people. Spoken about those who work in the ministry, work, in the church, are participating in worship services, are participating in community groups, are participating in tithing. So, man, what, what happens if I start questioning my salvation? Here's a secret that no one will ever tell you, all right? Everyone does at some point question their salvation. And you're like, what? Yeah. That doesn't mean that you stay there. It doesn't mean that you should stay there. And there's ways to, to actually deal with this. See, here's what I believe. I believe that there is not just a God in heaven who loves you, but there is Satan who hates you and wants to murder you. 
And Satan is constantly trying to steal your joy, to steal your love for Jesus, to steal your effectiveness in ministry. Satan is constantly trying to tempt you and deceive you. All right? And so he will come and he will tempt you to doubt the good gift that Jesus has given you in your salvation. And, and here's usually how this happens. You focus so much on your sin that you forget to focus on your Savior. And if that's you this morning, I want to encourage you. Would you focus on your Savior? He's a great Savior. He's a glorious Savior. He's a mighty and majestic Savior. His work on the cross on your behalf where he died for the forgiveness of your sin and his work in his resurrection which proves that God received and accepted his sacrifice on your behalf. That is mighty and glorious. It is absolutely effectual. And Jesus says that none that the Father give to me will I cast aside. And none that come to me will I lose. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Jesus is saying, once you're saved, when you're saved, when I come to rescue you from your sin, that is eternal. So don't allow the enemy to tempt you to look at your sin rather than look at your Savior. And then maybe there's other things. It's like, man, I'm not experiencing the same level of joy that I used to. I'm probably not saved. That is the enemy of your souls tricking you. And maybe you're like, oh, I'm experiencing temptation in ways that I, don't, I didn't think that, that Christians should be able to experience this kind of temptation. And yet the Bible says that we all will be tempted continuously. Right? And so we have all these different things, right? We have uh, different and false conclusions of our circumstances. It's like, oh, I'm struggling. I, I have difficulty. Clearly, that must mean that I'm not saved. God, God must not love me. I'm not one of his. False. Right? And so the enemy has all these little tricks. Oh, I, I relapsed into a sin. Maybe a sin that I've battled. Maybe a sin that I felt I had victory over. And oh, a Christian would not do this. So those are the, the different temptations, right? Where you're like, oh, I'm doubting, I'm questioning, I'm struggling to believe that I am truly saved. But I think they are the temptations of the evil one. Now, don't get me wrong. I used to, whenever someone would come in counseling and be like, Pastor, I'm really struggling to believe that I'm saved. I used to say, no, 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 let me assure you of your salvation. And I would give them all the things that I experienced that helped me be assured of my salvation. And I superimposed them on them. I don't do that anymore. If you question your salvation, maybe you should. Maybe you're not saved. Maybe you've never come to Jesus in saving reality. And I want you to. Right? Maybe it's just, have you... Okay, let's start. What is the gospel? The gospel is that Jesus Christ has come to this earth to save sinners. You're a sinner in desperate need of outside intervention. You are a sinner that does not deserve heaven and cannot count on heaven outside of throwing yourself on the mercy and grace of God. And the gospel is that Jesus has come to pay that price on the cross. The gospel is that God, in love and in grace and in mercy, freely gives you the right to be called a child of God. And your salvation is based on that and nothing else. And so here, here, is, here is a couple of ways in which you can be like, no, I, oh, I have assurance of my salvation. Number one, it's the, the test of your affection. Do you love God more? Do you love the Lord Jesus more fully? Do you love his word? Do you love his truth? Do you love to be with the people of God? What do you love? Do you love Jesus? Do you love him more than you love yourself? As hard as that is. The first thing is, what or who do you love? The second one is, it is, are you growing in your humility? And I'll be honest, the older I get, the more I'm like, I am so not what I think I am. I am in so much more desperate need 
for the grace of God and for the salvation that comes from Jesus. And that level of humility, as that is growing, as you're like, I need the grace of God. I need the grace of God. I need the blood of Jesus to purify me from all unrighteousness. That, as that is increasing, you're like, oh, okay. Oh, that, that's good. That's great. And then are you growing in your obedience? Are you growing in like, following Jesus wholeheartedly and follow, f- fully? Right? Are you growing in your obedience to the Lord Jesus? Those, those are ways in which you can look at, am I following Jesus? Or do I just kind of live self-deceived? See, let, let me say this, and hopefully this is encouraging to you. Satan is a liar. And he wants all the non-Christians to believe that they're going to heaven, that they're saved. And he wants all the Christians to doubt that their Savior's work has been effective in their life. See, that I think is the reality of what we're facing. You can be assured of being saved because you have a mighty Savior. And you are experiencing his love and his like transforming power in your life. Not perfectly, but consistently. All right? For the road is narrow and the way is hard. And yet, the way is Jesus. And man, here's the reality. You're Invite it in. It's not a door that is shut for you. It is not a gate that is barred from the inside. Jesus comes. I believe he would even do this right now. He takes you by the hand. And he leads you through the gate. You have a mighty Savior. You have a good God. You have a faithful father who knows how to save his own. I want to pray for us and we're going to celebrate communion. Communion is what what helps us look back to what Jesus has done to grant us access. So we remember his blood, his body, his work for us, and we rejoice. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for Jesus. God, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you care for us. Thank you that you have sent Jesus to die in our place. That that as you raised Jesus from the grave, you demonstrated that you have accepted this sacrifice once and for all on our behalf. God, I pray for all those who are struggling to be confident that they are saved. Would you help them focus on Jesus, focus on what he has done? But I pray for those that are like realizing I am not saved. God, would they today come to Jesus and receive new life, receive forgiveness of their sin through Jesus, receive an authentic relationship with the Father, receive love for God, love for his word, love for his people. Oh God, I I pray that as we celebrate um, this time of communion and of worship, God, you would fill us with the, the joy and with the assurance that we belong to you. Pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.